أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم I begin in the name of the Almighty God, the Compassionate, the Merciful, the one who has created everything in utmost perfection. And may the peace and blessings of the Almighty God be upon his pure and beloved messenger, the Holy Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa alihi. Allahumma salli ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad. And his immaculate progeny of the Ahlul Bayt, especially the leader of our time, the awaited Savior, Al-Imam Al-Mahdi, may Allah hasten his reappearance and make us all amongst his sincere and dedicated servants. My respected brothers and sisters, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. It is my utmost honor to welcome you to this course on Arab Arabic grammar. As you know, Arabic is the language of the Holy Quran. It is the vehicle, the medium that carries for us the word of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the final word of God. What differentiates the Holy Quran from previous divine books is that the Holy Quran is the actual word of God. It's not the word, the composition of any human being, even the Holy Prophet peace be upon him. He did not add a single word and there is a reason why the Prophet peace be upon him was unlettered, meaning he never studied under anyone, he never practiced reading or writing. Why? Why did God choose his final messenger who's at the peak of knowledge to be unlettered? meaning that he did not practice reading or writing. For what purpose? To demonstrate to humanity that this is my word, not the word of the Prophet. This was the miracle of the Holy Prophet. A man who never studied, who never went to school, who never practiced reading or writing in his life, yet he delivered such an amazing book that is so amazing, that is so concise. Historically, the Arabic language has been one of the most important languages in the world, even until today. Today, Arabic is spoken by how many million people? Can someone guess here? 1.6 million? Well, we have about 1.6 billion Muslims, but the majority of Muslims are not Arab, by the way. Only 20% of Muslims are Arab. So most Muslims actually don't speak Arabic. Maybe yes, they've memorized a few chapters from the Quran for the purpose of praying, but they don't speak the Arabic language. They're not fluent in the Arabic language. Is it 25 million? 25 million? 20 percent of 1.6 billion. So yes, about 20% of that. According to statistics, more than 300 million people today speak the Arabic language. 300 million. According to some statistics and estimates, 450 million around the world. So you have about half a billion people who speak this language. Now what's interesting about Arabic also is that when you compare it to other languages, you see that other languages have evolved and changed so much throughout history. Take any language today that existed a thousand years ago and compare the two. There's a big, big difference. If you go to the person who speaks that language and show him a manuscript from a thousand years ago and read it to him, they, would not, they probably would not understand it because it changed so much. The exception is the Arabic language. Some changes did happen, obviously. You've got many dialects. You know, each region would speak Arabic slightly differently than other areas. But classical Arabic, the Arabic that existed 14 centuries ago at the time of the Prophet, peace be upon him and his family, still exists today. The Holy Quran was revealed in the Arabic language. Until today, people who speak Arabic, they understand many verses of the Holy Quran. Many of the narrations of the Holy Prophet, especially those who grow up 
in purely Arabian societies. They understand many of the words of the Holy Quran, many of the words of the Hadith. So we see that the Holy Quran played an important role in preserving the Arabic language throughout history. Had it not been for Islam, Arabic today would not be as we know it today. It would have been evolved, it would have been changed. But the Holy Quran is what preserved classical Arabic. And this is indeed one of the contributions of the religion of Islam, that it preserved this rich language. Now before the religion of Islam, you'll find that Arabic was primarily a poetic language. It was spoken orally, rarely would it be written. Most people in Arabian society did not know how to read or write. They were illiterate. It was a very poetic language. Most people in Arabia, if they wanted to flex their muscles, they would be poets. They would compose poems, lines of poetry. And poets had major influence in society. You know, they were the speakers of society. In Arabian society, who were the speakers? They weren't religious people or politicians giving speeches. They were poets. If you were a good poet, your poetry, your literature was effective, you had a very powerful social standing in that era and in that society. So we see that the Arabic language before the religion of Islam, it was not really codified. It was not really written, the rules were not that clear. You couldn't go to a manuscript, a book, a dictionary to read about the language, to read about the vocabulary of the language, the grammar of the language. That was not existent in Arabian society. You just grow up there, you memorize it, you orally learn it, and then you speak it. After the religion of Islam, we see something different. We see an effort to codify the Arabic language, to capture the grammar of the Arabic language. And we'll speak about that shortly. Now what really distinguishes the Arabic language from other languages is that the Arabic language is heavily based on a root system. Every word that you speak in Arabic is derived from a particular root. And you have several types of roots, root words. The most common type is the three letter root. Let me give you some examples here so you can see. And at the level of deriving these roots, you have the minor derivative and you have the major derivative. Let's give an example here, so this becomes clear to us. So examples of minor derivatives Let's take the word Safar. Does anyone know what Safar means in Arabic? Travel. To travel, right? Safar. In Arabic, the word Safar is composed of three letters. The Seen, the S, the Fa, which is the F, and the Ra, which is the R. Now Safar means to travel, right? If you want to say he is traveling, you want to make it a verb, you would say Yusafiru. You just add a vowel, two vowels, the Ya and the Alif, and now you give a slightly different meaning. You change it from a noun to a verb. Safar is a noun, traveling, to travel. Yusafir is someone who is traveling. But we see that the root word, the seen, the fa, the ra, stay there. Only the vowels change. Inshallah in the future we will discuss these different forms. This is just to give you an idea. Now, you also have musafir,
Musafir is who? A traveler. You have now another word that is Safir. Have you heard what the word Safir is? Ambassador. ambassador. What does an ambassador have to do with traveling? There's some connection there, right? An ambassador is one who travels to a foreign state and he or she represents that state. So you're talking about some distance. So all of these words in essence capture one root word. One common meaning which is to travel. Now it depends on the form that you use, you can slightly give different meanings. Now this is the minor derivative, but there is a major derivative here. And this is more interesting, which shows you the depth of the Arabic language. When it comes to the minor derivative, we're talking about pretty much the same meaning, which is to travel. You're just changing the forms of the word. Traveling, he is traveling, traveler, an ambassador who travels. It's pretty much the same meaning. Now when you go to the major derivative, you have a more common meaning at the level of the root word that combines all these different meanings. Let's give a few examples. So we have safar here, which means to travel. We also have sifr. Does anyone know what the word sifr means? It's written exactly like Safar, the same three letters, but the vowels change, the haraka. That one is Safar, this one is Sifr. Does anyone know what Sifr means? Book. A book. That's why when you read about the Bible in Arabic, the book of Genesis is called what? Sifr at for example. Sifr means a book. It's using the same exact root word here. Now there's another word. Safir, this one's interesting, or Safira, does anyone know what the word Safir is? Uncovered. Uncovered, someone who's uncovered or in most societies they refer to a woman for example who is not fully covered or not observing the hijab, she's called a Safir. You see the same word is being used here there's just an extra vowel. And there are many, many other examples that we can find in the major derivative. Another word, tafsir, you've all heard this word. Tafsir uses the same root word. You know what tafsir is, right? Tafsir of the Quran, tafsir of the hadith. The exegesis, the definition, the explanation. Now, I want you to critically think now, tell me what's common amongst these words? Travel, book, somebody who's uncovered, tafsir. The letters sin, sa, and ra are common. Right, and that's why they have the same root word. But what's common amongst the meanings? I mean, why do these four words have the same root word? Because in Arabic, we said that the root word has a meaning and that meaning applies to all these words that have the same root, the same masdar, the same source. Now try guessing, what's common amongst these four words? What do they have to do with each other? Such that in the Arabic language, they put them in the same root word. They all have the same root word. You're, yes, exactly. You got very close. To, to make something apparent. Safar, to travel, especially you know in old centuries when you would travel, you would come out of your house and it usually was in the day, so you would come outside of your house, you make yourself apparent, you show yourself out of your house to go to travel. Hence we see that that original root word from the major derivative is there. 
Sifr, which means book. What does it have to do with showing or apparent? Showing information. Exactly. A book shows you knowledge. It makes information apparent to you, right? Hence, it uses the same root word. That's why any book is called Sifr, because it's uncovering knowledge. It's uncovering information for you. Do you see the connection here? This one is obvious, Safir, someone who's uncovered, or a woman who's not observing the hijab. Why, are she, why is she called Safir in Arabic? Because she is uncovered, or she is showing what usually is covered, for instance. Tafsir. Why is it called tafsir? Why does it use the same root word? Because it's showing the inherent meanings of the Qur'an. Meanings that are not apparent to the average person. Through the process of tafsir and exegesis, you make it apparent to the audience, to the listener, to the reader. And hence it's called tafsir. So you see that all these words, they go back to one major root word and there is something that combines them all and that's really amazing this this just this is just a glimpse to show you the depths of the arabic language and how interconnected the words are now this helps you by knowing how the system of root words work if you come across an arabic word it's the first time you read it you don't know what the meaning is if you can try to remember the root word, figure out what the root word is, and in your mind maybe you have an idea of the root word. Let's say you don't know what safir or tafsir or sifr is, but you know the word safar. You've heard the word of traveling. Try to make a connection there. This helps you many times in figuring out the meaning of an Arabic word. Just by analyzing the root word, you come to discover what the meaning is. You'll at least have an idea of what it means. So this is very interesting about the Arabic language, that it's based on root words. Now when it comes to Arabic grammar, we have two sciences when it comes to the Arabic language. We have what's called علم النحو, which is Arabic grammar, and this course will examine Arabic grammar. And we have, we have what's called Ilm al-Sarf. Ilm al-Sarf is a science that is studied in the seminaries. These days in the universities, most universities no longer really study the second science. Ilm al-Sarf is a science that focuses on the root words of the Arabic language. You'll study for several years being an expert on how this works. Now this that I just showed you, this is very brief. This is just the tip of the iceberg. You can go for years and years and delve into the science of Arabic when it comes to root words, how they work, their different meanings. And hence, the more you delve into the science, the more you come to realize how accurate the Holy Quran is. Why did God choose this word in this particular form, not in another form? Each form has layers and dimensions to it. Where do you learn that? In Ilm al-Sarf. But this is complex and it's quite complicated. We have what's called Ilm al-Nahu, which is just basic Arabic grammar. You dissect a sentence, where is the subject, where is the verb. To make sure that you speak Arabic properly, you're following the grammatical rules, the prepositions, the conjunctions, the adverbs, the adjectives. That has to do with Arabic grammar, al minnah Now before we look at the textbook, it's interesting to know how the science started. Because as we said, during the time of the Arabs, this was not codified. It was orally spoken. There was no formal science that people could read to learn Arabic. You had to go live in an Arabic society, grow up there for you to understand Arabic and Arabic grammar. Scholars and historians state that the one who established and founded Arabic grammar was Imam Ali ibn Abi Talib salam. Through one of his students by the name of Abu al-Aswad al-Du'ali. He was not a companion, 
because he didn't meet the Prophet He came shortly after the Prophet, so he's considered one of the Tabi'een, those Muslims who came after the era of the Prophet. He was one of the students of Imam Ali ibn Abi Talib and there's an interesting story that history has narrated for us how the science started. The story is that once during the time of the Imam السلام, Abu al-Aswad al-Du'ali, he hears a person reciting Surat Bara'a, Surat al-Tawbah. And he comes to one of those verses in Surat al-Tawbah. Let me write the verse for you. Abu al-Aswad was hearing this man. He was reading the first few verses of Surah At-Tawbah when he got to this verse. Anna Allaha bari'un min al mushrikina wa rasuluh. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the beginning of this chapter discusses a treaty that happened between the Muslims and the pagans of Mecca. They broke the treaty, the treaty of Hudaybiyah. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala declared to the Muslims, since the pagans have violated the treaty, then, and they're attacking you, they're waging war against you, now you can defend yourselves. You can go to war with them because they have broken the treaty. Now this verse states that Allah is pronouncing and declaring to the Muslim community that Allah is bari from the mushrikeen. God distance himself from the mushrikeen. In other words, God condemns the pagans who broke that peace treaty. Then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Wa Rasuluh. Abu al-Aswad al-Du'ali, he was hearing someone Recite this verse, that man recited it this way. Abu al-Aswad was shocked. Because just by changing one small vowel, the letters are exactly the same. You have Rasuluh here, there's a vowel there. Or Rasulih, that's another vowel, they're very similar but they change the meaning of the entire sentence. The Quran says Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala condemns the evil pagans who broke the peace treaty and they're waging war against the Muslims and the Prophet also condemns them and he dissociates himself from them. <coughs> now this is if you read it Rasuluh, because now when you read it Rasuluh, you're actually, this wow is a Conjunction, it's and. Allah condemns the pagans and, and the Rasul too also condemns. Now when you make it a different vowel, you make it the Kasra, this is called a Kasra. This changing this changes the whole meaning because it indicates that the wow, now this and and the Prophet, you're joining it after Mushrikeen. So God forbid, God forbid, you know, the meaning would be that Allah, you know, dissociates himself from the mushrikeen and from his own messenger. You see one small vowel changes the meaning of an entire sentence. So Abu Aswad al-Du'ali, according to this historical narration, he goes to Imam Ali ibn Abi Talib salam. He tells him, oh Imam, I heard someone saying blasphemy. He's changing the Qur'an by changing a vowel and he condemned the Prophet. Imam Ali ibn Abi Talib السلام, told him, okay, in order to treat this problem, to address this problem, we have to codify Arabic grammar so that people come to know these differences. After the Prophet remember that many non-Arabs were joining the Muslim community. The original Arabs, you did not need to teach them this. This was second nature to them. They knew this very well. However, those who came after the expansion of the Muslim societies, many of them were non-Arabs. Many of them came from Persia, many of them came from Rome, 
from different parts of the world at the time. They did not know the complexities of the Arabic language, so they would make such mistakes. Imam Ali ibn Abi Talib told, tells Abu Aswad al duali he says, go and codify this. Develop a system of Arabic grammar so people can learn it, they can study it. Because there was nothing at the time. So he goes and he works on developing Arabic grammar. When he comes back to see Imam Ali ibn Abi Talib السلام, he had written you know, some rules, basic rules on a piece of paper. He came to present it to Imam Ali السلام. The Imam also had a manuscript ready for him. In one hadith, Abu Aswad al-Du'ali, he says, Imam Ali ibn Abi Talib gave me a manuscript in which he starts by saying, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Language is composed of three parts. You have a noun, a verb, and a preposition. Subhanallah. You see the Imam Ali salam teaching him to dissect language. You've got a subject, you've got a noun. It has its own rules and laws. You have a verb. It has its own dynamics, rules, and laws. And then you have a preposition. And then the Imam explains to him, what is a noun? What is a verb? What is a preposition? And after that, we see that Arabic grammar, you know, was taught in society. After the efforts of Abu Aswad al-Duali, as instructed by Imam Ali salam. And you see the famous linguists of history, like for example, Sibawai. Sibawai is probably the most prominent expert in Arabic grammar throughout history. Sibawai is one of the students of Abu Aswad al duali but a few generations apart. He is one of his indirect students. So we see that all this Arabic grammar that we have today, with whose blessings and efforts was it preserved for us? The efforts of Imam Ali ibn Abi Talib So it is very important for us to know Arabic grammar, for us to gain a better understanding of the Arabic language, to better understand the Holy Quran, the Ahadith of Ahlul Bayt, because all these details make a difference in how you analyze a religious text, how you understand the book of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and how you understand the hadiths of the Prophet and the Ahlul Bayt, peace be upon them. So now if we can start with our textbook. For those of you who have copies, inshallah by next week we will have the full packet available for you. Let's go to page 9. In this chapter, we discuss what is called Al-Jumlatul Mufida. Al-Jumlatul Mufida is a complete sentence. In any language, you should have a complete sentence for it to make sense. In Arabic, there are several ways of formulating a complete sentence. So these are some examples. Let's write these examples. So we can see how we can form a complete sentence in the Arabic language. So the first example that we have in the book, Al-Bustanu Jamilun. Does anyone know the meaning of Al-Bustan? Orchard, garden, generally speaking garden, salamu alaikum. Let's say garden. Jamilun is what? You should know the word Jamil. Beautiful. Beautiful. Now in English, if you want to say the garden is beautiful, you want to say a complete sentence, how do you say it? You would say, if you want to say the garden is beautiful, you have to add a verb, right? It's called a helping verb. Al-Bustanu Jamilun. The garden, or a garden, if you want to make it indefinite, is beautiful. But in the Arabic language here, for this complete sentence, you only see two words. Because in the Arabic language, you don't necessarily need a verb to compose a complete sentence. 
In the English language, you need a verb. Every sentence requires a verb, right? Can you think of a sentence that has no verb? You have a subject and a verb. Do we have a sentence without a verb in English? Not really. The word is, it's called a helping verb, it's a type of verb. In the Arabic language, you don't need a verb. You just have two nouns. The garden is beautiful and this is an adjective that describes the noun. This in the Arabic language is a type of complete sentence. You don't need a verb for it to be a complete sentence. Now, in this sentence, it's the most basic type of sentence. It's composed of only two words and you need at least two words or more to make a full sentence. Let's give an example of a sentence that starts with a verb. The example that we have in the book is Shamma Aliyun Wardatan. What does this mean? Shamma Aliyun Wardatan. Shamma, it means to smell. Now, the word Shemma here is used in the past tense. He smelled. Aliyun smelled the flower. Now you see that this sentence, unlike the previous one, it starts with a verb. It's called a verbal sentence. We'll examine that inshallah in the upcoming lessons. And then you have the subject here who's Ali. And then you have Warda here. What's Warda? It's not, a, it's not a preposition, it's the object. What did he smell? What is the object of that verb? It's the rose or the flower. So this is another example of a complete sentence in the Arabic language. Let's, look, let's read some other examples here. For example, you will find that number two is الشمسو طالعتن. What does that mean? The sun is out. Now, طَالِعَةً that is masculine or feminine? Feminine. Feminine. Why? The ta at the end, if you see the ta that has the two dots, that is called a ta al marbuta. In Arabic, this is one of the signs that indicates the word is feminine. Now, we're not talking about a woman here, so why is it feminine? In the Arabic language, every single object is either masculine or feminine. This is something found in the Arabic language. So the sun in Arabic is feminine. Hence, if you want to describe the sun, you have to use an adjective for a feminine. The moon, on the other hand, is masculine. Is that just like a way that they categorize it? Yes, that's just the way they categorize it. There is really no formula for it. It's just the way the Arabs spoke. The qamar, the moon on the other hand, is masculine. So if you want to say the same sentence, al qamaru is out, the moon is out, how would you say it? al qamaru tali'un. Al-Qamaru Tali'. You would use the masculine form. I know this could get a little bit complicated if you're not familiar with the Arabic language, but through practice, through you know studying, this will become a lot you know more familiar to you. Which words are feminine, which words are masculine? It's a little bit difficult, but it's not that hard. <coughs> let's look at an let's look at another sentence. Number five. يعيش السمك في الماء يعيش is a verb. It's a present tense verb. Which means what? It lives. What's the subject of it? What lives? The fish. The semek. Now you'll notice that in English, first you have the subject, then the verb. The fish lives in the water. Normally in English, you always have the subject coming first, then you have what? You have the verb. In Arabic, it's quite the opposite. Generally speaking, there are exceptions of course, but generally speaking, you have the verb come first, then you've got the subject. 
over here uh, in the verse that we recited, Inna Allaha bari'un min al mushrikeen. Allah is bari from the mushrikeen. So you have the subject first, which is Allah. Then you have the verb, which is to dissociate or to condemn. So you'll find in the Arabic language, always expect that the verb will come first in a normal sentence, then you will get the subject. So this is one interesting difference between the Arabic language and the English language. So يعيش السمك, the fish lives in the water. Fi is a preposition. In one of the chapters, we'll discuss the prepositions. Fi means in. It's just a word that means in, inside something. Fi al-ma'i. al ma is water. So these are some examples that show us how a complete sentence is composed in the Arabic language. You could have two words, al-bustanu jamilun. There's no verb involved in the Arabic language. The garden, it's beautiful. And then you have some sentences which start with a verb, either a past tense verb or a present tense uh, verb. Therefore we see that in the Arabic language you need at least two words or more to compose a complete sentence. Now you could say, especially if you speak Arabic, but sometimes I've heard of sentences, you know, in which there's only one word. You don't need two words. Can someone give us some examples? Kalla. For example, if you say kalla, which means no. Or if you give a command. Qif. What does qif mean? Stand up. Qif in the Arabic language, how many words is it? It's just one word, right? But does it give you a complete meaning? Absolutely. You're telling a person to stand up. That's a complete meaning. But we just said that the Arabic language, for it to have a complete sentence, you need at least two words. So is this an exception? Or no, it's still following the same rule? It's still following the same rule because it means qif and qif. Exactly. In this example, when you say qif, stand up, there is a pronoun here that you've deleted for the sake of making conversation easy or because it's assumed that both parties know whom you're talking about. So in reality when you dissect the sentence in Arabic, qif anta, you stand up. You don't have to say you because it's understood by both sides. But in reality if you're analyzing the sentence and you're examining it from a grammatical perspective, you have to write the you. So even when you say stand up, it's also a complete sentence. You have the verb which is qif and then you have the subject or the pronoun you. Which you've deleted from your conversation because it's understood. There's no need to mention it. Or for example, someone asks you, how was the day today? You can just reply by saying one word, beautiful. Now you've, you've conveyed a full sentence here, a full meaning but you've simply deleted the first part. You don't have to say the day was beautiful because it's a given that you're talking about the day. So once when someone asks you how was the day, you, it was good, beautiful. You can just even say one word. So these are not really exceptions. We're still following the same rule that you need at least two words or more to make a complete sentence. But in the examples uh, that we've discussed here, there is usually a pronoun, another word that you've deleted for the sake of convenience and because it's understood what you're talking about. So these are some examples of a complete sentence. Now if you look at the box at the bottom of the page, it gives you, it always summarizes to you what we've learned in this lesson. Al-Qa'ada means a rule. Here's a grammatical rule. Number one, if you have a sentence in Arabic, a combination of words that gives you a full meaning, يُسَمَّى جُمْلَةً مُفِيدَ It's called a jumla mufida. Jumla mufida is a complete sentence. وَيُسَمَّى أَيْضًا كَلَامًا It's also called speech. 
So in Arabic when you say speech, it means that it's a complete sentence. It's a complete idea that you're communicating. So that's the first rule. The second rule, الجملة المفيدة قد تتركب من كلمتين The مجملة المفيدة, which is the complete sentence, can be formed by two words only. Like which example? Number one, البستان جميل. It's just two words. Now in English you can't do that. In English you need at least three words, right? Because you need a subject and you need a verb. Or actually if you use some types of verbs you can also, you know, um, make it two words. For example, he eats, he runs. These are just two words and they're complete sentences. So the same applies to Arabic. In Arabic, for you to form a complete sentence, you need at least two words. Min kalimatayn. So it's possible that you form a sentence from two words. وَقَدْ تَتَرَكَّبُ مِنْ أَكْثَرِ And it's also possible for you to form a sentence from more than two words. For example, number five. يَعِيشُ السَّمَكُ فِي الْمَاءِ These are four words. And you've given a complete sentence. وَكُلُّ كَلِمَةٍ فِيهَا تُعَدُّ جُزْءًا مِنْهَا Every word in that sentence is part of that sentence in the Arabic language, just like any other language. Now if you go to the following page, page 10, you see that this book, what's unique about this book is that after every lesson, it gives you practices. So that when you go home, you can review the lesson, you can look at these sentences in order for you to, to see which sentence is a complete sentence or not. So I highly recommend that after every lesson you examine these Tamarin, as it's called, or Tamrinat, these practices, they are really helpful in solidifying these ideas and illustrating the ideas that we've discussed. So for example, if you look at number one, it says, read the previous examples and list how many words were in each sentence. That's a basic task. Look at number two. It says, اقرأ الجمل الآتية. Read the following sentences. وَبَيِّنِ الْكَلِمَاتِ فِي كُلِّ وَاحِدَةٍ مِنْهَا And identify the words in each one. So if you look at number one, السَّمَاءُ مُمْطِرَةٍ How many words do we have here? <laughs> Two words only. What does السَّمَاءُ mean? <laughs> the sky. مُمْطِرَةٍ It's raining. This is a complete sentence. Now مُمْطِرَةٍ is it masculine or feminine? <laughs> Feminine, how did you know it's feminine? Because of the ta at the end, right? So what does that indicate? That the word sama in the Arabic language, the sky, it's a feminine word. It's not a masculine word. When Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, when He talks about the sky in the Quran, He uses the feminine pronoun. And so on and so forth, you'll see the other examples. Now number three, it is asking you to distinguish the complete sentence from the incomplete sentence. So if you look at number one, لَيْسَ الْجَوُّ Does anyone know what the word لَيْسَ in Arabic means? It's a word that negates, which means it's not. What does الْجَوْ mean? The weather. The weather is not. Is this a complete sentence? No, it's not. Even though you have two words, but it's not a complete sentence. أَكَلَ farid. Farid is the name of a male. What does akala mean? He ate. He ate. So Farid ate. Is that a complete sentence? That's a complete sentence. al qataru sari'un. The train is fast. Is that a complete sentence? Then yes. So this is just to, you know, train you that in the Arabic language, some of these sentences are complete and some are not. Number four, in ijtahatta. What does in mean here? If. Ijtahatta means what? If you make the effort. If you make the effort and then it stops. Is this a complete sentence or no? no. That's not a complete sentence. It's an answer to a question. If it's an answer, yes. But then if it's an answer, as we mentioned, there's something that's been omitted for the sake of conversation. But if you just say this initially, if you work hard, okay, then what? You need the then. So this is an incomplete sentence and 
so on and so forth. Number four, for example, it's asking you to fill in the blanks to make this a complete sentence. So see, these are some just some basic practices so that we, uh, you know, can further examine the first lesson. Now, you'll realize that today's lesson was, you know, pretty basic. This is just the beginning. And then as we go forward, we'll begin to examine and dissect dissect different aspects of each sentence in the Arabic language. The verb, for example, the nouns, the pronouns, the prepositions, all of them have laws and rulings and grammar rules in the Arabic language. We will examine them in our next lesson, inshaAllah. Wa sallallahu ala Muhammadin wa alihi tahirin. Allahumma salli ala Muhammad wa alihi.